Good morning. Good morning. I want to do a couple of things. On the one hand, I want to talk about the ways in which a real struggle for reparations could transform the African American community in a way in which it would, in fact, make us capable of leading that struggle. And in that process, I want to say some things about the use of history in that struggle. So let me start by saying that uh, my understanding of what we should be struggling for, what a 10-point program in African American for African American reparations would look like, is largely influenced by uh, the items that James Foreman and the National Black Economic Development Corporation included in the Black Manifesto, as well as it's uh, inspired by the strategy that they put forward in terms of pursuing the struggle for reparations. So I, I would suggest that we revisit the Black Manifesto in a serious way. I'm, I'm really, I was really delighted when I got the issue of uh, the latest issue of the Journal of African American History with James <coughs> Foreman on the cover, because it, 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 it helps crystallize this point about reparations. So what Foreman and uh, the National Black Economic Development Corporation argued was that we have to begin to build a modern communications infrastructure that we have to begin to construct uh, a printing infrastructure, radio, television, and create a land bank. We know that as late as 1910, African Americans owned 15 million acres of land. Today, it's down to about two million. We have to begin focus on developing organizing skills. We need a strike fund, building cooperatives across Afro-America, building cooperatives across Afro-America, increasingly, at this moment where we've seen young African Americans rise up, many of them are also articulating beliefs that the way forward is through individual ownership. And we've got to get people to understand that the only road to the future is through a collective process, a collectivization of the economy, not a privatization. Um, now, in that issue of the New York Times, June 9th, 2014, where they had a debate about reparations. There was an American Indian uh, scholar there, and he raised what I think was, uh, he, he really poked the soft underbelly of the African American issue around reparations. And, uh, Professor Fletcher, Fletcher was his name. And what he said was this, both American Indians and African Americans have momentous claims arising from historical wrongs, but their goals sharply diverge. Indians seek money claims for past injuries, but most Indian claims are rooted in tribal culture, governance, and land. Indians and tri Indian tribes are interested in self-determination, the right to live in their traditional homelands and to govern that land. But while African Americans eye individual payments, Indian tribes seek control over lands and natural resources taken from them by the United States and state governments. The advantage in the tribal strategy is to make Uncle Sam the bad guy. African American strategists should take note. <laughs> <laughs> now, he somewhat overstates the question. We've always taken note that Uncle Sam is a bad guy. <laughs> but the, the, the point about reparations as a strategy to affect self-government, the use of reparations to develop the Af African American community is what I think we should take from Brother Fletcher's uh, comments. Now, what I, what I want to do now is kind of sketch out some polls and give you some idea of uh, where the, how the public is reacting to reparations. As Professor Horn said, uh, we, we've been able to garner some international uh, support around various things, but let's look internally and see where we stand on reparations, because at the end of the day, right, it is our capacity to organize, galvanize the African American population that creates the only basis upon which we would merit international concern. You know, people international, they're not operating off of well, morality, as Gerald mm -hmm. said, they're operating off of political strategy, and you don't support folks who have not organized their own people in a, in a, in a, in a clear struggle. So looking at uh, some, some data points, um, uh, June 2014 poll by uh, 
shows that on the question of the legacy of slavery, and this is what they were asked, do you think the impact of slavery is a major factor, a minor factor, or not a factor in the lower average wealth levels for blacks and whites in the United States? And we know that the level of African American wealth relative to whites is about 14%, right? And so here's what the uh, survey found. 51% of whites say it's not a factor at all. <laughs> it is absolutely irrelevant. Right? Only 14% of whites say that it's a factor, a major factor. Now, amongst African Americans, 48% say it's a major factor. 27% say that it is a factor, which means that 75% of African Americans, right, and this is probably the largest group of African that we, uh, that we would get on any poll, 75%, would agree that uh, the oppression of slavery has something to do, has something significantly to do with uh, where we stand in terms of wealth. Now, on a, another question they were asked, do you think the government should or should not offer the following things to black Americans who are descendants of slaves? Um, so they asked two questions, cash payments and education and, uh, and job training. In terms of cash payments, 5% of white people say yes. <laughs> 59% say, hell no. <laughs> for African Americans, 63% are for training programs and a slightly smaller percentage for cash programs. Now, the survey also reveals that, well, let me shift from the survey and go to my class. Anybody familiar with the film Banished? Mm -hmm. Okay, I show Banished uh, after we finish uh, the Civil War. I, I, I lead in with Banished because I want to use it to raise two questions that I ask. The first question is about whether or not uh, those uh, Confederate leaders, right, and 20,000 richest slaveholders should have been charged with treason and hung by the neck until dead. <laughs> I don't phrase it that way. I actually say it should be executed. <laughs> but the question that's relevant for us is the question about uh, should the enslaved people, the freed people, have been compensated for 246 years without remuneration? And I get various kinds of comments, but in the main, and I've been asking this question since... Uh, for the better part of, of a decade. And what I, what I get, and I'm gonna use one white male student as kind of representative of my white students over the years, right? Um, and this is probably somewhat colored by the earlier part of the decade, meaning that levels of empathy amongst millennials has sharply decreased. So this guy is probably representative of an earlier moment. He says, the documentary film Banished raised the question of whether, well this is the question I asked, the documentary film Banished raised the question of whether African Americans who had land taken from them due to what was described in the film as racial cleansing are due reparations in the form of land or monetary payment. Using the three incidents presented in the film readings and class lectures or additional sources as evidence, do you consider reparations warranted or not in these cases? So Representative White Mill says, it is not a question that what occurred at the places in the film was sickening and wrong. I believe that there should absolutely be reparations due, just not in the way that some people were lobbying for in the video. I do not think it is rational or possible to just give land and money back to African American families <laughs> whose ancestors were victims of the racial cleansing. I do believe, however, that these cities owe the black community formal apologies. <clears throat> and need to make it clear to the public that African Americans are very much welcomed into their community. <laughs> that is about the, the, the level of what we're going to get there. Okay? Now, in the meantime, an uh, African American woman student responds, African Americans who experienced racial cleansing in Forsyth County, Georgia, Pierce City, Missouri, Harrison County, Arkansas, the three city, three towns in the, depicted in the film Banish, 
while trying to place a monetary value on the pain and suffering endured by African Americans throughout history may be an impossible feat. One place to start would be giving back the land and profits earned from that land stolen by whites in these counties. Monetary gifts or reparations would help African Americans become more sufficient in our society today. It would help but not fully put them on a level playing field to obtain the wealth that they have achieved that they would have achieved had they not been denied economic earnings and equality. That is again very typical of what you get from African American students. Now often you also get from African American students a notion that, well, this is something that I hope for, but it's impossible. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna happen, so we need to move on right. to something practical while while acknowledging that need. So what I want to suggest is that we have to construct a strategy that will convince our people that reparations is not simply a pipe dream. And this is where I want to interject and say a couple of things about history, right? And by history, I mean the study of the past. That if we are doing our job, right, then the histories that we write should do three things for the average person reading them. One, they should explain how the current situation came about. Two, they should explain that the current situation is a product of choices. It is not inevitable, it is not God-given, it is a product of choices, and that there were always alternatives. And it's for this reason that when I teach uh, my African American history survey, I have a section that I call a tale of two Tommies. And so one Tommy is a criminal, a, a pedophile, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> and I lay out Thomas Jefferson, right? His positions, what he stood for, et cetera, et cetera. You know the thing, the line where he says that uh, the birth of a black child every two years is the best investment that one can make. <laughs> and then I go to another Tommy. The other Tommy is, uh, oh man, I'm getting a brain freeze. Tommy Smith? No, 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 come on, Jerry. You know that. <laughs> Same time in the Revolutionary War, wrote Common Sense. Oh, Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine. See, because what I'm trying to do is help white students understand that there were revolutionary alternatives as opposed to criminals. And that if we emphasize white anti racists right, that's helpful. And to get black folks to see that. You know, it wasn't all of them. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that point is that that helps them see that there are choices and alternatives. And that's what we want to do is point out the road not taken yeah. and what that road, had we taken it, might have yielded, right? The third point is that people, ordinary people, can in fact change society because it is ordinary people who make society. Okay? So we want to emphasize those kinds of things as a kind of base of what history ought to do. And in doing that, we have to you know, be clear that we're not talking about that, that African American history, like all history, is overdetermined. That is to say that it's multi-causal, right? That there's no single uh, uh, cause. There are leading factors, but there's no single factor in history that moves things forward or leads to regression. It is always complex and multi-causal. So that in any theory of history, we must be able to talk about structure, transformation and directionality. That is to say that we have to understand that reparations is a global demand of African people, but in each society that we find ourselves in, the structure is different. That is to say that the racial formation has some differences and we have to, pretend, we have to attend to the particularity of those racial formations. So we have to talk about the local as well as we connect it to the global. We've got to always make the link, but we have to understand the particularity. Right, of those things. We have to talk in terms of transformation. What are the factors, right? What are the conditions under which, what are the processes that lead to transformation? And finally, we have to talk about the direction. What are the properties? What is the criteria by which we understand whether things are moving forward or back, whether it's progression or regression? And I say that only because we have a black man sitting as president who has been absolutely clear that he considers in this period, in this period, that there has been what he calls progress, right? When, when, uh, if you take the quality of life social indicators, only on the question of elected officials, number of elected officials, will you find that there is a clear argument for
progress if we're speaking numerically, yeah. right? But on all the others, you get mixed, or you get a clear example of regression. So just to throw out one regressive measure, because when you talk about wealth, the critical factor in wealth is home ownership, right? Mm -hmm. In 1940, the gap between white ownership, white home ownership, and African American home ownership was 23 points, right? 20, 23 point gap. In 2010, it was a 28 point gap, right? And we can go on and on. All right, so now, what am I essentially trying to say here? I'm saying that where James Foreman challenged the religious community, we have to challenge the African American community around the question of reparation. Now, we start with a strong base of people, right? But if we are not able to build local movements, right, for reparations, if we're not able to use the, the struggle for reparations to reconstruct the black community on a, on a, on a, on a basis of democracy, and here's what I'm, 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 what I'm trying to say, that too often, even black radicals have accepted European capitalist ways of doing things, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The current universities have uh, accepted corporatization, and they now, you know, they folks are CEOs, they're naming people executive uh, vice chancellor, executive vice provost, executive vice dean, all that bullshit they brought in. <laughs> and the language is merely indicative of of, of, of the ideology and the logics. Mm -hmm. We have been following suit in this undemocratic practice. We know that one of the reasons for the largest migration of Africans to the United States being after 1980 is because of the undemocratic practices of these tyrants functioning in a neo-colonial system, right? We know that within the African American community, our efforts to get ordinary people involved is often inhibited by people who think they should be in office 30, 40 years. And this is a problem from the local church to the professional association to the civil rights group, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things I'm, I'm suggesting is that we use reparations to start a campaign for a strong participatory democratic culture in African American society. And we use it to go back to the large scale mass meetings that we go back to the pan-strategy to organize block by block. And that's what we're going to have to do. And then as we begin to construct that 10-point program, ten point program of reparations, program. as we begin to construct <laughs> that 10-point program, ten point program, what's going to be in it? What's going to be in it? This, this is not a matter of calling together the NAACP, the Urban League, and even if there was a national black radical organization, you know, the, of that stature, like, say, the BRC might have been... Uh, Wow, seems like a lifetime ago. <laughs> it wouldn't be a matter of just putting their representative on. It must come out of the communities, out of the people at a basic mass level that we must construct that agenda. We as scholars, we can contribute, we can help guide, but at the end of the day, if we are going to create the kind of society that we want to live in, we are going to have to find a way to get back to the mass and create a strong, participatory, democratic culture. Uh, in summation, I'll just point to uh, C.L.R. James, who I think uh, probably wrote the greatest book ever in Black Jacobins, right? A book about the Haitian Revolution that actually provides instructions to Africans struggling in the contemporary period for liberation. James said in this quote that he called the future in the present. And what he meant was that the social relations that we hope to create in the future, we must begin to live them in the present. If we want to, uh, to get reparations, we are going to have to begin to create inside black America the type of institutions, networks, and social structures and social relationships that are built upon the values that we would want to use the reparations to create. Thank you. <laughs>